Good morning and welcome to the next session. Next session is on abnormal ocular movements. As you all know, abnormal ocular movements is a very difficult topic for the pediatric ophthalmologist. And um, we would like to make it simple and uh, easy to examine and how to make a diagnosis and how to manage abnormal ocular movements. We will discuss this in the next one hour. I request um, the first speaker, Dr. Naina Haider, to come on stage and present her talk on Pursuits and Saccades. Dr. Naina is the Associate Professor of Ophthalmology in Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Tivandrum. She is heading the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus for more than 10 years now. Over to you, ma'am. Welcome, Dr. Rashmin Gyanthi, to this. Good morning, and uh, I see a crowd which is interested in abnormal ocular movements. I'm surprised. Anyway, saccades and pursuits. The fundamental goal of the visual system is to the fundamental goal of the visual system is to detect and detect objects and motion in the environment and it is to track and keep the fovea with the objects of interest and get a high spatial resolution. So the ocular motor system directs and holds the fovea in alignment with the objects of interest with six supranuclear systems, namely the ocular fixation, the vestibular ocular system, optokinetic, saccades, pursuit and virgins. The ocular motor tracking systems, the ocular fixation system is a fast, whereas the saccade is also a fast system. The VOR, the OKN, and the virgins are slow. The ultimate purpose of the ocular motor system is to establish a clear, stable, and binocular vision. And the two basic eye movements which help to perform this task is gaze shift and gaze stabilization. The cortical centers controlling the eye movements you can see there are many, but the frontal eye field stands out as the hero number one. And when you can see the, the parietal eye field, the medial suprotemporal visual area, the striated cortex, so these are the areas which are important in the cortical area which will have the eye movements control. And another area is the brainstem area, which uh, the PPRF, the MLF, the vestibular nucleus, the cranial nerves, the sixth, uh, third, and fourth are linked in the midbrain, the MLF. We'll be coming into it. I'll so coming to saccades, saccades means to pull. It's a French word, sacquer. That is, it is a rapid pull, like on the reins of the horse you pull, and you can rapidly shift the fovea to the target of interest. It's described as a ballistic rapid eye movement that cannot be altered once initiated. And the speed of the saccade correlates with the extent of eye movements. So this is the saccade eye movements, which is a rapid eye movements which you see. And the initiation of the saccade, you have a pulse and a step. So the saccade, in the, in the pulse, you have the, it, which enables the globe to overcome the inertia and viscous drag with the orbit. So it starts with the pulse and ends with the step. And the pulse determines the saccadic velocity. The step maintains the position of the eye after the saccade. So, but each, uh, the pulse and the steps are controlled by different centers. The, in the brainstem centers, the pulse of the horizontal saccade is, uh, is by the PPRF in the pons, and the step is the medial vestibular nucleus and the nucleus prepropsis hypoglossi. For the vertical saccades, the pulse is done by the rostral interstitial nucleus of MLF in the midbrain, and the step is the interstitial nucleus of Kajal. There is a phenomenon of neural integration in saccade, and the, for the saccade to be accurate, the velocity of the saccade that is the pulse innovation must match the final ocular position maintained of the saccade is complete, that is step innovation. So pulse, step. 
And this process of matching the pulse and the step components of the saccade is referred to as neural integration. The characteristics of saccades, velocity, duration, waveforms, tra trajectory, latency, and accuracy are all important you have to see during a saccade. And the velocity is, as I said, it's a very velocity movement, 500 degree seconds, and the latency is 200, and the duration is less than 100 milliseconds. So testing of the saccade is self-paced or verbally guided. And uh, this video will show it's a, that you have two targets kept symmetrically apart, and the patient is asked to look into those targets. You have horizontal saccades and vertical saccades being checked. And you can also go torsional, oblique saccades are also checked. And you can also have the verbally guided saccade. That is, you can ask the uh, patient to look at your nose and a target on one side. And you can verbally ask the, look to, ask the patient to look to your nose and then to the target. So on the either side, or vertical and oblique. Come to pursuit eye movements. It allows continuous clear vision of the objects moving within the visual environment. If the motion of the uh, target is unpredictable, pursuit shows a lag. And if the uh, target motion is predictable, there is no lag. That is, in the first case, if you have a fly uh, beating around you just now, so it's going to be, the pursuit is going to show a lag. But when you have a very smooth, continuous movement, like the child on a swing, uh, there is no lag. That is how they have described pursued eyed movements. And uh, pursued eyed movements are very slow movements. And uh, it is just uh, by looking to, to a target which is moved very slowly, horizontally in the visual space and also upwards and also diagonal. So for the pursuit system, you have a frontal eye field and you, it is a double decusator, uh, decusation system. So it is an ipsilateral system. So you can see in the uh, dorsal area, that is the midbrain, uh, you have those fibers coming, the temporo-occipital uh, fibers coming in from the frontal eye field, going into the midbrain, coming into the cerebellum and the flocculus, and then also going. So it's a double decusator. So all the uh, pursuit movements are going to be ipsilateral, whereas the saccades are going to be contralateral in cortical lesions. So the clinical importance of this pursuits and saccades are the supra supranuclear systems are pathways that converge at the level of the brainstem to innovate the ocular motor cranial nerve nuclei. Their separate origin allows selective disruption of these ocular motor systems by disease processes. Therefore, a targeted clinical examination of these systems allow the clinician to identify the affected system and determine the responsible disease process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naina, for that uh, very exhaustive presentation, getting into the basics of ocular movements. Now I request the next speaker, Dr. Arya, to present her talk on virgin's eye movements. Dr. Arya is the Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology from Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Trivandrum. Over to you. Thank you, Madam. At the outset, let me thank the KSOs and especially Dr. Naina Jabin Haider, Madam, for giving me such an opportunity today to speak about virgins. So what is virgins? Virgins eye movements are where your eyes move in opposite direction, or these are disconjugate movements. In versions, you know, your both eyes move in the same direction. So versions can be convergence and divergence. So what is the stimulus for this virgins movements? There are two primary stimulus to the disjuncting eye movements. One is the disparity between the location of images in the two retina, which produce diplopia, and that leads to fusional virgins movements. And second one is the retinal blur or the defocused images. And this also leads to a loss of sharpness of the positive images and accommodation-linked virgence movements. So this is a basic stimulus for your virgence eye movements. Now, convergence is a disjugate movement in which both the eyes rotate inwards so that the lines of sight intersect in front of the eyes as shown in the picture. And this allows bifoveal single 
vision to be maintained at a fixated distance. So convergence remains more or less same throughout our life and it doesn't deteriorate like our accommodation. So power of convergence can be increased by exercises. So what is the angle of convergence? As denoted in the picture, you can see it is an angle that is formed between the primary lines of sight during convergence. And one meter angle convergence is exerted by each eye when eyes are directed to an object at a distance of one meter of the meridian line between the two eyes. And now coming to the types of uh, convergence, it can be voluntary as well as reflex. And there are four types of reflex. One is tonic. As we know, it is a convergence that results from the inherent innervational tone of the extraocular muscle when the patient is awake. And this is independent of fusion or object proximity. And this is the most prominent in childhood. And the tonic convergence decreases with age. Second is your fusional component. It's an important mechanism for maintaining bifoveal single vision. And the normal fusional convergence amplitude for distance is around 18 and for nearest 35. And it helps to control your exophoria. And this fusional convergence decreases by fatigue or illness. And next is the accommodative convergence. It occurs when the eyes accommodate. And that is a part of the triad of the synkinetic near reflex complex. And last one is the proximal convergence. It is induced by the proximity of the object of regard. So these are the four types of reflex convergence types. Now next we have to know certain terms regarding convergence. One is the near point of convergence. That is the nearest point at which the patient can see a single. And far point of convergence is where? When your eyes are at rest. When your eyes are at rest, it is in a slight divergence. And hence the far point of convergence will be lying somewhere behind your eyes. And next is the range of convergence. That is the difference between NPC and FPC and amplitude of convergence. That's the difference when a patient looks at the nearest point where he sees a single and the far. Now this is an instrument by which we measure convergence. As you all know, this is a RAF ruler, the Royal Air Force ruler from, where, from which we can know the near point of convergence. So it has got four boxes. The one is a reduced Nellens chart. The second one is a, a section of the general post office telephone directory. Third is a, a third one is a C is a Times Roman typeface, and fourth is a, a dot on a line. So there are four things on this RAF ruler, and for measuring the NPC, we use the last one that is a line. Now this is how you measure the near point of convergence using the uh, RAF ruler. You explain to the patient what you intend to measure. You move the box near to the eye of the patient and ask her. At up to what point you can see it as single. When she sees a double, then that is the near point of convergence and it is indicated in the RF ruler. From that, we can notice what is the near point of convergence. Normal NPC is 7 centimeters. Closer than 5 centimeters is excessive and more than 10 centimeters is considered as defective. Now, how do you measure the how do you measure the amplitude of convergence? How do you know that? Now we have seen how you measure the near point of convergence. Coming to how you measure the amplitude, you have got two methods. You can use, you can calculate it with your prism bar or the synoptophore method. So this is a video which shows how you can measure the uh, positive fusional versions. That is, give an accommodative target, ask the patient to look at that, and using the prisms, First with base out, you increase the power of the prism, you ask the patient to concentrate on your target and ask when she is seeing it as double. In the video you can see, I am increasing the power of the prism and at a particular point the patient will be seeing, saying that she is seeing it as double and that is a break point. Now you reduce the power of the prism and come to the recovery point also. For uh, calculating the negative fusional versions, the same principle only but you But you just change the you change the direction of the prism. That is, in the first one we saw it is base out. Now you keep it as base in. So you can measure the negative fusional versions. In the video you can see I has I have uh, changed the direction of prism. So what are the anomalies of convergence? First is convergence insufficiency, which we commonly find in our uh, clinics, convergence paralysis, and convergence spasm. And convergence insufficiency can be primary or due to refractive errors, presbyopia, or consecutive convergence insufficiency. 
and how can we diagnose it? The main complaint of the patient will be asthenopic symptoms and these are the methods by which you diagnose it. And treatment can be optical and orthoptic. And one is advancement exercise, which is easier to say and easier to perform at home also. You ask the child to hold the uh, target at a distance, come to a near point where the child can see it as single at the maximum near point, and ask the mother to monitor this exercise because otherwise the child will be doing in some fancies, he'll be moving at his own will. So teach the parent nicely how you have to do the exercise and uh, ensure the parent that the parent supervises this during the initial period. This is a stereogram car test. These are uh, strings which can, uh, you can, it is available online also, but this is done in an office method. This is the diploscope. And these are the other associations of uh, convergence insufficiency, neurological diseases, that is Parkinson's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, and the following conditions. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Arya, for that presentation. She's a very versatile person. Uh, she has uh, multiple interests, Dr. Arya. She's a dancer. Uh, and now I request um, uh, Dr. Naina uh, for her second presentation on internuclear ophthalmoplegia and other supranuclear abnormalities. So we are going to the clinical scenarios here. I've uh, discussed about saccades and pursuits in a very short uh, so just look at this patient who had come to our hospital with this uh, moment abnormality. So her pursuits have been examined. So we'll come to this picture with a magnified view. So we'll be talking about the MLF. So the MLF is a myelinated nerve bundle which connects the third, fourth, and the sixth uh, nuclei in the brain stem. And the, the MLF lesions produce the INO and the one and a half syndromes and the related syndromes. So this is a very typical and uh, very f familiar diagram we have always learned in your of ophthalmology. And uh, you can see that the, the left uh, the parapontine uh, reticular formation is the uh, brainstem uh, center which uh, sends impulses to the abducens nucleus. And from the abducens, it goes to the MLF, to the ocular motor, and the ocular motor which will supply the, uh, the left uh, medial rectus. And uh, that will give you the right gaze. So if you have the INO-like symptoms, INO lesion, the patient presents with a horizontal diplopia that is not in the primary gaze, it will be more in the opposite side of the lesion and there is a difficulty in tracking high speed objects, a dizziness in the lateral gaze and headaches because of the brainstem uh, involvement. So if you want to diagnose a INO, you need a good extraocular movement assessment and you will see that there is an ipsilateral adduction deficit with a contralateral abduction deficit. In the picture, you can see the primary gaze, the patient looks fine, but on the uh, right gaze, there is normal uh, adduction and abduction, whereas on the left side, left gaze, you see the adduction is minus two to minus three, and uh, there is also going to be a decreased horizontal velocity. So coming to this patient, which I showed earlier, So in this patient, you can see on the uh, right gaze, the right eye abduction nystagmus, and uh, if you can see, there is a left eye nystagmus, and there is a uh, convergence deficit on the right eye too. So if you just go back, I'll show you again. So even in the left side, you see the abduction is minus one, abduction nystagmus on the right, Whereas on the left gaze, there is adduction minus one with an abduction nystagmus. So this is a bilateral INO. So usually INOs, may, maybe you can get bilateral, bilateral lesions because uh, the MLF is in the midline and it is not surprising that you always get a unilateral. So there's another, uh, for the postgraduate interest, there's the INO plus uh, lesions, that is the hypertrophic skew deviation on the same side with abnormal OKN. 
and uh, you get a vertical gaze. As I said, INO is a horizontal gaze deficit, and, but in INO plus you get a vertical gaze abnormality too. Now pseudo INO you get in myasthenia and also in Guillain-Barre syndrome. And uh, convergence may be normal or absent because in anterior INO, which is there is a lesion in the midbrain, there's, so there's going to be an absence of the convergence, whereas in posterior INO, it is uh, said to be in the pons, so the convergence is going to be normal. Bilateral uh, INO, webino, you have a primary position exotropia, and uh, you have bilateral adduction deficit with bilateral abduction nystagmus and a vertical gaze evoke. Uh, nystagmus. That is also webmino and uh, monoocular I, you know, with primary position uh, exotropia. Coming to one and a half syndrome, that is uh, where the MLF and the PR PPRF are involved. So in this picture, you can see that um, on the uh, right gaze, you have an abduction uh, minus one, the left eye abduction is normal, whereas in the primary position is normal. But on the left gaze, you have uh, the adduction also a deficit, the abduction is de deficit. So the only movement which is there is a abduction of the uh, eye and that is, this is the left one and a half syndrome. So there is no horizontal movement in the ipsilateral eye, only movement you get is a abduction in the contralateral. So etiology of INO and one and a half and the syndromes is demyelination in a young patient, ischemia in older patients, infections, inflammatory, and so on. I'm coming to perinodes. Perinodes um, is a condition where you get a vertical gaze palsy. So I was talking about horizontal. So, so just look at this uh, video. And uh, you'll see a very typical movement in this patient who was referred from the neurosurgical department is a 40-year-old patient who had a very, very interesting like picture. This is a convergent retraction nystagmus. And uh, he had an up vertical gaze palsy. So I was al always asking him to look up, but he was trying, but this is the picture you get when he's trying to look up. So this is a very typical convergent retraction nystagmus and this patient was operated for a pelanoma. So, so the lesions for the, uh, the etiology for in, uh, the perinodes is the brainstem hemorrhage, pelanoma, hydrocephalus, AV malformations and head trauma. Then one more condition, progressive supranuclear palsy is also a patient we had, but unfortunately I don't have a video. It is diagnosed to be like a Parkinsonism. It's a differential diagnosis for Parkinsonism. Patient has Parkinsonism-like features, poor response to levodopa, because levodopa is given for Parkinsonism. These type of patients don't respond. And they have a vertical saccade and problem. Usually they present with down gate, downward gaze palsy, up, up, up gaze palsy later. And they have this very, uh, very uh, square wave, wave jerks. I hope uh, Dr. Rashman Gandhi sir would show those uh, pictures because I didn't get a video for this patient. And they have convergent insufficiency. So saccades and pursuits have to be assessed in every patient with neurological or neuroophthalmic signs. And abnormal ocular movements may not be confusing and challenging if a thorough extraocular movement assessment is done. Thank you, ma'am. I would really like to thank Elizabeth Madam for putting me in the hot spot with this abnormal extraocular movements, but I have definitely read and I hope to get better. <laughs> Thank you, madam, for that excellent presentation. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Elizabeth Joseph, madam. She needs no introduction. A passionate pediatric ophthalmologist, and she can be addressed as a superwoman in strabismus surgery in India today. She's a HOD and heads the pediatric ophthalmology department at Little Flower Hospital, Angamali. She has innumerable awards, papers, and she's an excellent teacher and a mentor. And she does simple as well as complex strabismus surgery in a flash. She still keeps her passion for her subject by having talks on all these three days in Drishti 2023, Trishur. And over to you, dear madam, for your talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arya, for that uh, very kind and wonderful words. Thanks. Now, uh, I'll be talking on nystagmus surgery. When and how? See, nystagmus, all of us know, is just a repetitive to and fro involuntary eye movements initiated by slow drift of the eye away from the direction of the gaze. It could be congenital or acquired, 
acquired is always a problem. It may be due to labyrinthine, vestibular, cerebellar causes, and then there is this, uh, as, you, as uh, Dr. Naina has already said, the convergence retraction type, CISO, I think uh, Dr. Rashmin Gandhi will talk about all those things. All these things, the acquired nystagmus is a problem. It has to be referred to the neurologist. Imaging is mandatory. Whereas uh, congenital nystagmus or nystagmus in children come to the pediatric ophthalmologist and we have to manage that. The most important of the nystagmus uh, types in children, uh, the most important one is the infantile nystagmus syndrome, which will include both the motor and the sensory. And then there is the manifest latent nystagmus or fusion maldevelopment nystagmus, which is usually associated with esodeviations. And these two conditions are uh, potentially benign and you may not need much of imaging, but the other two like uh, periodic alternating nystagmus, spasmus, newtons, etc. has to be investigated for neurology problems. Coming to the treatment, first and foremost, you correct refractive error. If there is a refractive error, contact lenses are superior to spectacles because when the eye moves because of the nystagmus, the contact lens will be well centered. Whereas uh, spectacle, the visual axis and the optical axis will not co correlate and hence uh, contact lens is superior if there is a refractive error. If there is no refractive error, there is no point in giving contact lenses. And uh, if there is a small abnormal head posture, can be corrected by prism, but not larger than 15 degrees. Botulinum toxin has got a role, but it has to be repeated. So uh, it's not practical. Biofeedback, acupressure, etc. have no uh, role at all and these are not uh, effective. The medical treatment also is not effective, not of much use. The surgical management is very useful. And uh, nystagmus surgery, the most common indication is nystagmus with abnormal head posture. If the face turn is more than 20 degrees due to a, a, a null point in one of the eccentric gazes, then this is the most common condition which is amenable to surgery. And nystagmus without face turn, we can do surgery, but the results are not that great as the ones with abnormal head posture. Coming to the timing of nystagmus surgery, that is very important. Uh, in orthotropic patients with nystagmus, you wait at least five years of age because the binocular system has to be developed well. Otherwise, the binocularity may not develop. So um, five years to about uh, nine or 12 years of age, you can do nystagmus. Even in adults, you can do nystagmus surgery, but it's always, uh, you can remember that it's the school age children. That is the best time for nystagmus surgery. But if the nystagmus is associated with an isotropia, like in Ciancia syndrome, we have to do an early surgery. Acquired nystagmus, most often we don't do any surgery. And if you want to do surgery, wait at least for one year. And uh, pre-surgical uh, evaluation, full uh, ocular exam, neurological workup when needed. Uh, you know, one thing uh, is that you have to uh, make sure that the null point is consistent. There is something called periodic alternating nystagmus where the null point uh, varies. In such cases, if you do nystagmus surgery, you are likely to fail. And the measurement of face turn has to be done by the goniometer. Nystagmogram is not mandatory, but it has got academic uh, importance. This is how you measure the head posture of uh, using a protractor and the scale. The scale is directed at the, uh, one, one arm may be directed at the visual axis and the other against the uh, axis of the head. The, the angle between the two is the angle of the face turn. And uh, this is how you do a video nystagmogram where an infrared camera is placed in front of the patient's eye. And uh, there is the, this is the stimulus generating area and this is the record. This is the record. This uh, is not mandatory, but you if you have access, you can do it. This we did, uh, I don't have, uh, we don't have the nystagmogram in ophthalmic department, but the ENT people have this. And so we do, uh, did this from the ENT. And uh, interpretation of the nystagmogram, uh, you can have this low face, the numerical values, oblique uh, angle, etc. This is the nystagmogram of the right eye and the left eye. Uh, and coming to the nystagmus surgery. In uh, nystagmus surgery with the face turn, in, in, when there is a, uh, when in, in those conditions, when the f face is straight, the nystagmus is more and the vision is less. So they turn the face to one side and keep the eyes to some other state. So in this case, there is a null point in the uh, right lateral gaze, that is in dextroversion. The, in this position, the nystagmus is dampened and vision is improved. 
So the patient keep the eyes in, in the lateral gaze and the face will be turned to the opposite side. So the principle of the surgery is to shift this null point to the primary position so that the patient do not need to have a face turn. And the, uh, the, base, the first uh, nystagmus surgery was described by Kirsten Bohm, uh, consists of recess resect of horizontal muscles, but he described only a 5 millimeter recess resect procedure, which was found to be not enough. And then there is the Anderson procedure where he described only recession. For example, in this eye, recession of this medial rectus and recession of this lateral rectus. That is Anderson surgery. Now what we do is the uh, combined Kestenbaum Anderson surgery. Uh, in the original Kestenbaum, uh, only 5 millimeter surgery was done, but Parks, uh, have, Marshall Parks have modified it to produce this classic maximum procedure, which is the 5, 6, 7, 8 millimeters. For example, if the eye is deviated towards the uh, right side like this, you do a resection of 7 millimeters of this lateral rectus, resection of this medial rectus, 5 millimeters, resection of this medial rectus, 5 millimeter, resection of this lateral rectus, 8 millimeters. Now, uh, one thing, how to decide which eye has to go for the larger uh, recession and resection, the, it's easier to remember this way that um, each eye will receive an equal amount of surgery. Uh, the, like 13 millimeters in equal, equal amount in uh, when the medial rectal surgery and lateral rectal surgery is total, it will be an equal. And lateral rectal surgery is always greater than medial rectal surgery but those medial rectus is a more powerful muscle. Uh, so, uh, muscle and maximum surgery for LR resection. So in this case, LR resection is 8 millimeters and uh, uh, the other LR is 7 millimeters. So LR, uh, mo maximum surgery for LR, LR resection the most. That's how we uh, remember this. And uh, up to 30%, uh, 30 degrees of face turn, you can do the classic maximum. If there is more of uh, face turn, more than 40% you have to have augmented surgeries like 40% uh, augmentation or 60% augmentation whereby you do this much, this large, 8.5, 9, 9 uh, 7 and larger surgeries, the same principle so that a maximum of about 18 millimeters is done. See, just watch the video of this child. This, she has got only a 20 degree face turn. Now the child is reading the Snellen's chart with a small face turn, 20 degree face turn. This surgery, this child underwent only augmented Anderson procedure where the right medial rectus was recessed 9 millimeters and left lateral rectus 12 millimeters recession. That is Anderson alone because the face turn is small. And uh, we, we took an electro uh, video nystagmogram of this patient. This is the pre-operative video nystagmogram and this is the post-operative. You, you can clearly see that the amplitude of nystagmus has come down. And see this child has got a larger face turn. Uh, th th this child also sitting in my office and reading the Snellen's chart. The face turn is about 45 degree and you can see the primary position nystagmus. You can see the primary position nystagmus. Uh, so this child needed a uh, larger surgery. We did a 40% uh, augmentation where lateral rectus 9.8, medial rectus 8.4 of the right eye and left eye medial rectus 7 and lateral rectus 11.5. And see, look at the uh, post-op video. This one. See, again the child is reading the Snellen's chart with almost a face uh, straight and uh, uh, looking at the nystagmus in the primary position, the amplitude has definitely come down. So uh, what I want to give the message is that nystagmus surgery is effective and the patients are always happy. It is not 100% successful, but you get at least 80, 60 to 80% success in these nystagmus surgeries and most of the patients are happier. <clears throat> if the nystagmus is associated with the strabismus, see this patient has got a face turn and in the primary position right eye is divergent. Now, now the principle is first you correct the nystagmus in the fixing eye and correct the strabismus in the uh, strabismic eye uh, as a, uh, two stages or you use an adjustable suture in the single stage. See this patient, uh, the face turn and after surgery, uh, nystagmus surgery, you can uh, see that the squint is corrected, the face turn is gone. In complex situations like face turn with a head tilt, with the face turn and a head tilt, then it is difficult. 
And then you can combine oblique muscles along with the horizontal, but that becomes a huge big surgery. Now, the other option is to offset the horizontal. See this child um, with a huge head, head tilt and a uh, face turn. So what I did is a supra placement of the right lateral rectus, infra placement of the right medial rectus, and in the left eye, in the left eye, supra placement of the medial rectus and infra placement of the lateral rectus in addition to the recess resect procedure as per the custom bomb. And uh, we could get a good result. Some people will come with just chin up position due to vertical nystagma, just chin up position, then that is easy to correct. Do inferior rectus, superior rectus of one eye or do uh, inferior oblique anterior transposition. <coughs> what about nystagmus without a null point? Like in this child with albinism, these cases um, we usually do not do anything, but if you want to reduce the amplitude of nystagma, some surgeries are there. One is uh, making artificial divergence by doing a small MR recession. Other procedures are so you just recess all four recti, tenotomy and attachment to the fascia, all these are described, but the chance of uh, recurrence is there, chance of induced strabismus is there. Nystagmus blockade syndrome, patient presents with esotropia and uh, when you uh, cover the other eye, there is a nystagmus of the primary position. Because of the nystagmus of the primary position, which is dampened by the convergence, patient presents with a convergence squint. This can be easily tackled by uh, usual surgery for, uh, for the convergence squint, but uh, you have to increase the um, amount of convergent, uh, amount of surgery on the medial rectus. And uh, coming to uh, another condition in which uh, I just finish, finish in one minute time. Uh, CNCS syndrome is esotropia with an abduction nystagmus. You just watch the child, there is esodeviation and the abducting eye goes into nystagmus. This uh, can be corrected by strabismus surgery medi by medial recession, but it's better to do a posterior fixation suture on the medial rectus. In these conditions, the uh, squint will be corrected, the amplitude of nystagmus will become less. Probably the nystagmus may become, um, um, the, may become latent. The, the manifest nystagmus may disappear, but it's likely to persist throughout life. Complications of nystagmus surgery, not many. Probably success rate is a little low. Recurrence is possible. So you have to warn the patients that sometimes recurrence occurs in a few years' time. And uh, consecutive strabis strabismus we usually don't see. Thank you very much for patient hearing. Thank, thank you, ma'am. And you have seen the superwoman in action. And she has discussed and done surgeries in a very, very easy manner. Now coming to our next speaker, a keynote address. I would like to invite Dr. Rashmin Gandhi, the master of neuroophthal in India in the present times. He has an experience in the field of neuroophthalmology for more than 20 years. He is a director of Axon MedTech Private Limited, managing director of Foresight Worldwide, uh, director and consultant of Center for Sight. He's, uh, he has so many awards and publications, and he is very much into innovation. I, I have to say a few more. Just one. So he's a principal investigator of the role of ocular movements as a marker for dementia. He has a wide interest in uh, new technologies in ophthalmology. He's an excellent teacher, innovator, conducts revision courses for FRCS exams since 2001. And his latest achievement award is Asia, Asia Pacific Ophthalmology Society Award in 2019 at Bangkok. And I welcome, sir, for this talk on nystagmus evaluation. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, KSOS. Uh, thank you, Dr. Naina, for giving me this honor. Um, it is always a pleasure to be part of the course with Dr. Elizabeth, ma'am. And I also thank you and Arya for taking up the more complex uh, subjects and doing a wonderful job with it. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, nystagmus evaluation. If you see a patient with nystagmus, are there any steps that you would deploy in your OPD to distinguish between nystagmus, which is because of a neurological origin, and nystagmus, which is non-neurological? So uh, these are uh, the effective steps that one can follow in the OPD. 
the first question you ask yourself when you see a patient with nystagmus is, is it present in primary gaze or is it absent in primary gaze? Second, you look at the movement and say whether the movements are horizontal, vertical, torsional or mixed. The third thing is to uh, find out whether is there any fast phase to the nystagmus. If there is a fast phase to the nystagmus, that is called a jerk nystagmus. If there is no fast phase, as uh, Dr. Elizabeth uh, also showed, then it's called a pendular nystagmus. And the last point, uh, which is very important, is to see what happens to nystagmus when you ask the patient to look to the right, left, up and down. I would suggest that we have this uh, particular step done in all patients with nystagmus, and I'll show you why that is important. So now this is a, a first uh, a primary gaze. Uh, see this patient in a video, you see patient looking to the right. Right now, the nystagmus is absent. But when it goes right to the end of the, the gaze, you will find that there is this little bit of fluttering movement. This is called endpoint nystagmus. It is uh, physiological. And how do you uh, uh, find out whether it's an endpoint physiological nystagmus is, you'll find, see, this is absent in primary gaze. It is brought about right at the end of the gaze, and it is generally transient. Versus this patient, and I would like you to see, see this is absent in primary gaze, okay? But you can see what kind of nystagmus you will say this is, would you say this is horizontal? Or it's more like a torsional nystagmus. But the difference here, you see that nystagmus starts much before the end of the gaze. You can see the sclera here, and nystagmus has started. So when you find a nystagmus which starts before the end of the gaze, that is called gaze evoked nystagmus. Contrast it with the endpoint nystagmus, which is physiological. Gaze evoked nystagmus generally is because of a problem in cerebellum or area around uh, brain stem. Gaze evoked nystagmus can be because of the drugs. In young patient, it can be a sign of demyelination. And older patient, it can be because of the stroke. So these are two examples. The first thing we ask ourselves, if the nystagmus is absent in primary gaze, two possibilities, endpoint nystagmus, physiological, or gaze evoked nystagmus. Now let's see uh, if we are able to dissect what you're seeing here. It is present in primary gaze. That was the first step. Now what do you think? How the eyes are going? Any idea? Yes. So that's a vertical movement. Now, did you find any fast phase here? Look at uh, carefully and see whether a vertical movement, is there a fast phase? Yes, the fast phase is towards the down. So this is an example of a down beating nystagma. So first important point, it was present in primary gaze and it was vertical. When you have this kind of nystagmus, which is vertical with a down beating nystagmus, which is becoming much more when the patient looks down, it is likely to be, again, a problem with cerebellum. And as Dr. Elizabeth mentioned, it should be neuroimaged. What about here? Is it vertical or horizontal? Vertical. And now here, any difference? It has a fast phase, but it is up beating nystagmus. Very good. Now see what happens here. Patient is converging. And the patient looks straight. What happened when the patient converged? There was a dampening. This is a classical, near classical feature of Wernicke's encephalopathy, where patient has a upbeating nystagmus. When you ask the patient to converge, either it gets dampened or it becomes a downbeating nystagmus. So we looked at two important points, whether it's present or absent in primary gaze. Second, whether it's horizontal or vertical. We saw two examples of a vertical nystagmus. Uh, so upbeat uh, nystagmus can be because of lesion in cerebellum or lower brainstem, while downbeat can be because of uh, drugs like lithium or lesion in middle cerebellum. Let's continue and see if you are able to see here. Uh, I know it's a little dark, but do, what do you think is happening? Is, is it vertical or horizontal? It's vertical, right? But this vertical is because of this. And uh, example was shown. What do you think here? 
you can see there is no fast phase it is swinging like a pendulum so a difference between a pendular nystagmus and a jerk nystagmus is that in a pendular nystagmus in a primary gaze it swings like a pendulum the importance of noting this down is because a lot of this and as dr elizabeth mentioned this patient also uh, the pendular nystagmus was because of albinism causing foveal hyperplasia a person born with a very poor vision uh, since childhood can be cone dystrophy foveal hyperplasia bilateral macular scar can exhibit pendular nystagmus so generally it is because of an ocular problem however these patients you should look at the palate carefully because pendular nystagmus can be part of what is called as oculopalatal tremor here you can see the palate also there is a tremor in the pa palate which would be in synchronous with a uh, pendular nystagmus and this uh, if there is a palatal tremor as well then the pendular nystagmus would be part of a neurological disease now when do you say that it is so this is pe present in primary gaze it's a horizontal nystagmus and you see when the patient looks to the right what is exhi being exhibited here is that when patient looks to the right nystagmus almost settles down uh, telling you that there is a null point whenever you see a null point you know that most probably you are dealing with infantile or congenital nystagmus and as dr elizabeth mentioned that can be treated you bring the null point to the primary position and patient would have uh, no nystagmus in primary gaze and would have improvement in visual acuity so infantile or a congenital nystagmus these are the features they are asymptomatic patient would not have a symptom of os oscillopsia they are most of the time they are jerk nystagmus you will have a, a fast phase and mainly it will be horizontal with presence of null point and when when you ask the patient to converge the nystagmus would be dampened now this is uh, this is the patient many years ago which i saw in shankarnitral and uh, one of the reason why i got interested in neuroophthalmology was because of this patient this patient actually came to our uh, resident training clinic where patient was diagnosed as having a unilateral nystagmus because of amblyopia a dense amblyopia can also cause a vertical nystagmus and patient was actually undergoing patching for a long period of time as i said an important step of a nystagmus is to see what happens to nystagmus when you ask the patient to look to the right left up and down and i told you this is because of this patient he was told that he has a nystagmus you can see there is a vertical this is called hyman bilchaski phenomena where uh, there is a vertical movement in one eye and patient was undergoing patching for the right eye for 5 6 months but see what happens when you ask a patient to look to the right left up and down you see now there is a nystagmus in the other eye as well can you see there is a nystagmus in the other eye and the nystagmus was what is described as a seesaw nystagmus so that was missed in the initial period so patient went around with that nystagmus for 6 months seesaw nystagmus is a feature of problem around optic chiasm so we requested this patient to undergo mri scan patient was found to have a large craniopharyngeoma uh, and unfortunately he did not survive the surgery so now we don't know if we had picked up a uh, craniopharyngeoma 6 months prior to the presentation whether the patient would have survived but it highlights the importance of the point which was mentioned that nystagmus can be the first and the only sign of a very serious underlying neuroophthalmic problem this was shown by dr naina this is an example of uh, convergence retraction nystagmus where uh, you see also patient has a light near dissociation a larger pupil and when the patient is looking at the okn drum there is that retraction this is a part of perinot syndrome or dorsal midbrain syndrome so these are the nystagmus which has an effect of convergence that is the last step of uh, your examination of nystagmus congenital nystagmus typically would uh, be dampened by uh, convergence uh, and an upbeat nystagmus may be, uh, may become better or may become downbeat uh, as seen in wernicke's encephalopathy these are the uh, nystagmus which probably can be treated with medications and generally that is done by uh, a neurologist uh, some of these nystagmus do uh, respond to uh, medications like memantine or uh, neurontin or tegretol Uh, uh dr nena also wanted me to talk about uh, 
ocular flutter, the square wave jerks and opsochlorus, which are part of a similar kind of problem. Uh, the square wave jerks are abnormal uh, saccades where the eyes, they are always horizontal and they move and they come back, they move and they come back. They are called square wave jerks. In a horizontal way, there is no gap, but the eye just keep moving without any saccadic interval, then that's called ocular flutter. If, if they keep moving in all direction, then it's called opsoclonus. The square wave jerks, which is generally transient, uh, may be non-specific, while ocular flutter and opsoclonus would be because of neuroophthalmic problem and would require a further workup. Uh, some of the videos that I showed you were given to me by Dr. David Z. David Z is one of the foremost uh, authority on ocular motility and nystagmus. He works at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And some of the patients were uh, seen when I was working at Shankar Nitralia. I thank you once again for your very kind invite. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deshman Gandhi, for the very nice presentation. You have cleared many doubts made. Uh, nystagmus so simple. Uh, I, I have just one question for you. Uh, what is your opinion about medical treatment like uh, baclofen and all? And uh, are you doing it and what is the dose? Yeah. So I generally uh, ask my uh, neurology colleagues to see whether, uh, whether they are, uh, because most of the time these patients would have some underlying neurology uh, pathology. Uh, we have seen uh, some of these patients saying that they felt better. I've never seen any, uh, any nystagmus completely go away, but sometimes patients do uh, report a minimal improvement in vision. Surprisingly, patients with superior oblique myokymia, which is not directly a nystagmus, uh, I have two patients now who have responded to topical timolol drops, where they are, they are symptomatic. Uh, superior oblique myokamia, when the eye is twitching, they feel that image jump when they look at the, the books and all. And they said that the frequency or uh, frequency had diminished completely with topical timolol twice a day for after two weeks, they, they reported the change. But as I said, it's a too small a number to say that it really works. Uh, but uh, the, the medication, I don't have any patient who, who came back and said that it completely went away. Any question for the audience? It was an exhaustive uh, session pre lunch. <coughs> so, when you uh, find a case of uh, nystagmus, uh, when did you when do you ad uh, advise surgery? Is my I, my question is then. Uh, in, um, in uh, infantile uh, nystagmus without uh, face turn, do you advise surgery and uh, what is your personal? Uh, so we had done a, a observational uh, kind of study in Shankarnitralia where we said that, oh, patient does not have a, a significant face turn, just a little face turn, but has a null point. So can you now just bring the null point to the center by doing a procedure and see if patient reports any uh, any change in visual acuity since null point is where patient probably has the best vision we didn't really find significant uh, change unless there was a face turn so we feel presence of uh, face turn or a, a neck deformity is where the surgery would help the patient the most and just a word about what uh, dr Naina and uh, had mentioned about the saccades uh, we 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 don't check saccades so often but they are Sometimes the pursuit movement, the, the way we check the oculomotility in our clinic might be normal. And the only abnormality can be saccadic slowing in a lot of neurodegenerative disorders. PSP, uh, first sign would be saccadic slowing. Parkinsonism can show saccadic slowing. If you are referred a, a child who has uh, Wilson's disease, they can show saccadic slowing. Early or recovered cranial nerve palsy, like say six nerve palsy, can have only saccadic slowing in one eye. I mean, the ocular movement will be full. So I think we'll wind off the session. And uh, thank you all for coming and attending the ocular movement.
Thank you. Thank you.